from Holy Trinity Church in Inwood, New York City. Welcome to Inwood Artworks On Air. It's where we meet musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists of all stripes that make their home what we affectionately call Upstate Manhattan. I'm your host, Aaron Sims, and this is Live and Local. It's our podcast dedicated to showcasing the musicians of Upper Manhattan. We talk with them about what they do, and best of all, listen to them perform live at our favorite, favorite local venues. Today, we are excited to speak with composer Brian Morales. Brian is a composer who thrives on the communal participation of music and storytelling. He is most widely known for his orchestrations of John Doyle's The Color Purple, which featured Cynthia Erbo from a very young age. Disney's Fantasia has always inspired Brian. The combination of expressive and extroverted visuals mixed with dynamic melodramatic music is an element that regularly dominates his creative output. Many have complimented his music for his emotional catharsis and descriptive film score-like quality. His chamber ballet, Strangers, was his first serious large-form work for woodwind quintet, percussion, and four dancers, which was completed during the pandemic. Brian, being no stranger to orchestral writing, won first place in the Pittsburgh Philharmonic EQT Young Composers Contest and as both a Talis and Alba Music Scholar. He received his MM in Composition from the Manhattan School of Music and his BM from California State University Fullerton. We are thrilled to have him play live for you today one of his compositions. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian Morales. Thank you. 
Brian, that was fun. Thank you for sharing that with us. And thanks for being on the show. It's good to see you again. Thank you for having me. You bet. So what's been happening? Oh, a lot. I just had a baby. <laughs> that must have been very hard for you. How was your wife doing? Uh, recovering. <laughs> um, no, I, I think like the rockiest part of it has, uh, has finished. Now it's more just kind of like, okay, so this this new little human in my life. So. Wow. How many months old now? Not even like one. She's a uh, seven weeks now. Wow. <laughs> that's amazing. Not even that's, more than two. <laughs> that's, that's incredible. So a new composition indeed. Uh, yeah, I know. She's my, my magnum opus. My, absolutely. My last, my big project. Yeah. <laughs> I call her that. Well, congratulations. <laughs> that's great. Well, thanks for sharing. Um, tell us what you just played for us. A variety of styles and improv- improvisation, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I um, actually... So what I've been doing uh, with my, my baby, my daughter, is uh, every month I play in a different key. And so this is the key of E, which is why I started in that. And I was just thinking like, oh yeah, the, the strings for the guitar are E, A, D, E, G, B, E. And so that's why I played that first. And then I just went with that. Great. Uh, and then, like, I just always have blues in my heart. So yeah, <laughs> I just love playing it. Well, you have a lot to be happy about right now, though. So I do. Um, I just like... You know, the, there's like the stressful moments, and then it's like it just gets washed out with those like sweet little smiles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I guess I guess my, I got to go straight to it then. So, uh, have you played Fantasia for her yet? No, no. <laughs> I she mean, come on. <laughs> she hasn't gotten to that stage. Uh, we have played Beethoven Six. We have. She has listened to all of Brian Eno's um, <laughs> music for airports. Okay. She's listened to the Chronic. By Dr. Dre. It's, it's a great, good variety. <laughs> um, and then my mom's played her a bunch of uh, James Taylor stuff. For contemporary masterpieces included. Oh, yeah, yeah. Very I good. Like... Who who would have thought that Beethoven would be included with The Chronic? But, uh, <laughs> or, and James Taylor. The repertoire. Yes. As I, as I call the, it. the kid's going to come out so well versed. Not even uh, funny. Yeah. That's all I could hope for. Well, I, <laughs> I love the fact that Fantasia was an early influence for you. It was for me, too. You know, I, but not Fantasia 2000. Too, I mean, not that it's well, not a good. Piece, you weren't but like you weren't also growing up in the year two thousand either. I, no, no, I was I was yes. a fully formed adult at that yes. point. <laughs> no, um, I just there's something really special in my heart about Fantasia, and the more I, every time I look back at it and watch it again, I'm like, oh man, this was really groundbreaking, breaking, and like forward thinking what they were doing. Yeah. Um, and just like the mixture of music and and animation, it's yeah, you know, it's it's very much how I think as an artist, like. Um, even if I'm doing like a show, like a theater piece, like I, I imagine very vivid characters with lots of movement on stage. <laughs> so it's uh, that's my uh, my thought process, I guess. Well, I love the fact that you have that as an influence coming up because I was the same way. I, I remember putting the LP on in my parents' basement and running around and just without without the actual just just the just the album cover was mm-hmm. was dramatic in itself and uh, all the. St- the explosions and the stars and everything else like that. Um, and so, uh, but running around in basement and, and enjoying the music and composing things are two separate things. So what, what encouraged you to go into music as a vocation to, to compose? I don't know. <laughs> um, Somehow you got there. I, I remember being in, okay, I remember being a kid loving Fantasia. I remember being in middle school and we got to go to Disneyland and they took us to this like show that was running that summer called Blast. And Blast was basically drum corps on stage. <laughs> um, and there was something about that. I was just like, this is so cool. I want to do stuff like that. Um, and then somewhere along the lines, I ended up like writing music for ballets. Um, but I guess they, <laughs> I guess they kind of go hand in hand because like marching band is, is very much choreography. Sure. Um, I don't know. Did you, play, I, you play in band? Oh yeah, I played in band. Uh, what, was, what was your instrument? I was a saxophone player. Um, yeah, I, I, I th- there was this point where I was like really practicing every day, and I just like felt really weird. Like I never felt like I was into it, and I would always get really angry and grumpy when I'd have to spend twenty bucks on a new read. But I was fine paying somebody two hundred bucks to like play on my you know composition. <laughs> so I was like, maybe I just don't want to be a sax player. <laughs> Uh, so I kind of put that to rest. Um, but yeah, I, 
hey, I don't know what composer it was that maybe think like I want to do that. Maybe Stravinsky. You know, maybe that's kind of why I went in the same choice. same route of ballet because yeah. he did a lot of those. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, you know, now it's kind of like crossword puzzles. When I start a piece, I'm just kind of like, how can I finish it? <laughs> what do I have to do to finish it? Wow. Um, that's, yeah, that's well, me. <laughs> that's that's great. And, um, well, speaking of, let's just jump ahead to, like, your composing. Um, you know, you, uh, can you tell us about the Chamber Ballet Strangers? Because you're talking about, you mentioned the, the composing for ballet yeah. uh, and how the music came together for it. So. Um. Well, I'd worked with Julia, the choreographer, Julia Bankston. I've worked with her for years, and we kind of had little things that, you know, started out as small pieces and got bigger and bigger. Um, but, like, the kind of main thread was always kind of stuff about immigration. And, you know, she's Swedish, so she does have this perspective of what it's like being an immigrant in the U.S. Um, I think for me, I guess I just always have this this thing in my back of my mind of just like what about the immigrants because I feel like they're they're an easy target um and it's was, it was so funny I was just looking at my phone today and like the news popped up yeah it's years after a border separation a family's reunion was in a judge's hands and I just felt like I I read that stuff all the time now um anyway it's heartbreaking. Uh, yeah uh and so you know, I I don't know what else I can do except express my feelings about that. Right. Um, so, yeah, I wrote this ballet, <laughs> uh, and it's it it's delicate because uh, it's hard to tell that story, you know, coming from like essentially a white man. <laughs> um, so I tried I approached it more abstract and tried to tackle like the emotions of like what I was going through and what I'm seeing and how I feel about it. Um, and so the heart of that ballet is really just more like n no one's immune from becoming an immigrant or a refugee. So like, how, how do we, how do we deal with that? Yeah. Well, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I feel like you're a very collaborative composer yeah. um, of people and, um, and, and, and larger ideas and subjects. And uh, so what, what are those important questions that you ask a collaborator or you or you you ask together as you're approaching a piece yeah with with Julia it was very much <laughs> I think we spent a lot of time on form and you know we started out with small pieces and like we, we knew we wanted we had these stories we wanted to incorporate but we didn't know how we were gonna incorporate it and then it it kind of came out of this question we were always asking about form that we kind of realized what if we have this one character, Zani, who starts at one end of the stage and is crossing to the other side? And that's the whole ballet, or like the overarching structure is this character going from one spot to the other. Um, and Zani in Commedia dell'arte is kind of this character that comes from the country, going into the city looking for work, and their, their nose is always looking up there because they're always, you know, at the bottom. Um, and that's. I feel like that's a good parallel to what immigration or what immigrants are, uh, particularly in the U.S. But anyway, so this character Zani ends up like in three times in this ballet is always going one direction from one side to the other, and at the end of the ballet, um, Zani actually dies, and this other character Columbina takes on the Zani mask, and she's cast out of the place that she's in that Zani was trying to get to just because she was helping him. Um, and so the end of the ballet is Columbina going the other direction that Zani was going because she's now in the same journey but in the opposite way. Um, and I think, like, I can't think of a more abstract way of expressing, like, none of us are <laughs> immune yeah. from this. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's, like, just kind of thinking about form kind of created that. Mm -hmm. And then, then the, we, once we had that, it was like, oh, yeah, I'll just let's tie it together. <laughs> yeah, well, that's great. I think the, Thanks for answering the question about you know putting things together because um, you know when you're starting from nothing, mm -hmm. you need you need a, ma a map of some kind and you don't have one in front of you, so you need to create it. it can either be a, a bagatelle or it can be a Mahler symphony. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like when you have a blank page, it could be whatever you want. Exactly, uh -huh. exactly. And hopefully, we'll see strangers in 2024. Yeah, here's here's hoping. You know, here's hoping. <laughs> um, well, let's touch also. Uh, I mentioned earlier, um, you know, you the orchestrations on John Doyle's. 
uh, Color Purple on Broadway. What was that gig like? The funnest job I ever had. <laughs> um, yeah, I well, the way it came about, I was playing for this little group in uh, this little theater in Los Angeles called um, <laughs> Celebration Theater. And it, it was a very, like, sweet space to work in. Um, you know, it was just like, it felt like a real community. And, you know, I was, I was doing, like, yeah, every show for, like, $15 a night. Like, it was nothing. <laughs> um, but I was just starting out. And, you know, it was, I was having a good time. Like, the band was so good. Uh, and we extended up to, like, 14 weeks just because, like, everyone wanted to see that show. Uh, and I guess it was so popular, it caught the, caught the ears of uh, the people that were producing it at Menier. And uh, yeah, so I, I got a random email one time, just like, oh yeah, you want to come and do it here? And I was like, yes, yes I do. <laughs> uh, and I would think I was like 25 at the time, and I was like, yeah, this is the rest of my life, right? Um, and that didn't happen, that's okay. But uh, yeah, working with John Doyle was, that was an experience. He, you know, he's kind of famous for like doing these, like stripped down shows with, you know, like the actors playing instruments and that sort of thing. Um, and we, I didn't quite do that, but um, we just like watching his process, he kind of is maniacal in a way. Like he really designs it's every very specific. little detail. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, but he doesn't know music. So like, I was the one that got to do that for him. And it was just like a real treat to watch him work. Um, and then Cynthia Revo hadn't become Cynthia Revo yet. She was hadn't been discovered yet, so that was kind of cool, too. Um, I always like to joke that she sat down next to me and just started talking to me. <laughs> and I was like, that was... But she did. <laughs> but she did. She did do that. <laughs> um, and, yeah, just like... It, it was cool to be in a space where, you know, not, not like we had, like, infinite funding, but, like, we just had a lot of resources to really put the best possible production that, that we could muster. And I, I don't think I've ever been in a space like that since. But yeah. So I'd you'd like it. to go back to it if the opportunity arose? I mean, yeah. Who doesn't? Well, I'm <laughs> what, what well that's a Broadway doesn't. show. That's a Broadway aimed show. And yeah. did you, did you, but you started. Um, did you work for it on Broadway, or was it the Out of Town tryout in, um, in California? So that show had already gone to Broadway. Yeah. Um, and so this was kind of John Doyle's version. Yes, exactly. That they they yes. did this in is the UK the, first. The revi the revision. Yeah. 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 And this was like, yeah. And so and then from there I went to Broadway afterwards, but yeah, I uh, <laughs> uh, I loved it. Um, you know, I just I like working with I like working with like medium sized groups because that there's a real challenge to getting it to sound amazing and unique, but not just not like a dinky <laughs> orchestra. <laughs> yeah. And you know who else is good at that? Stravinsky. <laughs> there you go. It goes about Stravinsky. Well, yeah. speaking of amazing and unique voices, um, you've also composed other original music outside of musical theater, uh, such as Harlem Dances. Yeah. Yeah, right? Um. Uh, and and uh, it's inspired at least in part by living in Washington Heights, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I started out growing up in Washington, not growing up. <laughs> no, I started out when I moved to New York. I was living in Washington Heights, and then I moved down to Harlem. Um, and it just. You know, there's just so many sounds here. <laughs> there's so many flavors of music. Um, and again, just kind of like, how do I express like my excitement and enthusiasm of synthesizing what I'm hearing out here without, um, what's the word, <laughs> capitalizing on it or, you know, making it my own but appropriating it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was like, well, I know string quartets. <laughs> Uh, so the f the opening rhythm is actually like a reggaeton rhythm. It's that boom, 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 boom. But then like I just, you know, strapped on a really hairy harmony to it. <laughs> and it like, it kind of got me going just here. And I was like, yeah, wait, where's this go next? And so then like that kind of gave my, like I gave myself permission once I got through that to just like, okay, now I can take all these different flavors. Like there's a little bit of klezmer. There's a little bit of like, Javanese gamelan going on and just like yeah like let, why not <laughs> why not it's I think it's like all coming from a fun place and I think that's what's important so that uh and that kind of took years like I wrote it once and then did a rewrite and then took another couple years off and then rewrote it again and at the time my friend Cleo Goldberg was starting their chamber orchestra out in Chicago of all places and 
I happened to be going there for a few days, and I was like, hey, I have this string quartet. Do you want to record it? <laughs> and their group did it, and I was so lucky. Like, just the musicians that, that were there for, like, three hours, they just rehearsed it and nailed it. <laughs> and I was so happy, like, hearing, like, what they brought out of it so quickly. Um, you know, and it's, like, going back to collaboration. That's That's the fun part. It's like you can spend all day writing out and hoping you can, you know, guess what all the problem areas are going to be and fix them. But then, like, when they get there in the room and they just do it, it's like, oh, that's heaven. Well, you said it up brilliantly. We have actually, you provided us with a clip of it, or not clip, the full, the full uh, re recording of this. Mm -hmm. And so we want to share it with our listeners now. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy Harlem Dances. Thank you. 
That was awesome, man. And uh, isn't this also part of a larger piece as well that you started this? Yeah, uh, it's a larger piece in that I intend to write it. <laughs> um, I want to do three other movements, but I want to base them on different points in the U.S. So the next one I actually want to do is in Chicago, and then I want to do one in L.A., and then one in, I think, Dallas, somewhere in Texas. But like these are just four points. And then like my crazy composer brain <laughs> that's like, you know, synapses flowing. What I want to do is like have four different quartets play the whole work simultaneously at the same time, but then like feed it all into some live stream in like Wyoming where you can listen to all four of them. <laughs> and I don't know, just this idea of like unity um, or just universality of like this music happening in different places throughout the U.S. Um, but yeah, each, each movement I wanted to base off of these different areas. So Harlem's obviously based off of my experiences in New York. Um, and I don't know what LA is going to be, but I know it kind of wants to sound like acid. Well, you're going to have to find your own neighborhood in LA for that. I know. And, I, and guess what? There's a lot oh, no. of them. I, I, I live there. I lived in NoHo um, and it, it ended with me delivering pizzas. So it's, it's, a, it's kind of like a weird poisonous but also well, cool there's your place. there's your acidic neighborhood and, yeah, right that's, there. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's like I want yeah. that. Kind Chicago of... has a lot of great neighborhoods, and hey, you never know, you might get that string quartet back. You know, hoping. You, that would be great. <laughs> and Dallas, I don't know. There's Dallas is pretty expansive. Yeah, you, you know. no, it'll be it's the expansive slow movement. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, well, we look forward to that coming around when it does. <laughs> um, but I also um, want to take us out on another original composition. Uh, you brought to share with us called uh, One for RBG. Mm -hmm. uh, would you mind giving our listeners a little lead-in for this tribute piece to Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Yeah. Um, it's just a piece I wrote after Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. Um, I just felt like, you know, she was such an important figure just in U.S. politics, uh, in the legal system, um, just as a woman, you know, Again, I just had like a lot of admiration. Um, compositionally, I stole this from David Noon. Um, I just wrote a bar for each year of her life. And I, you know, I had like an opening idea and kind of went with that with the, these confines. And at the end, I kind of quote, uh, I forget the, the uh, aria I quote from, it's a Wagner opera. Uh, I forget the German text, but um, it's, a, it's the scene where Lohengrin is saying goodbye to this mm -hmm. swan. Uh, and instead of singing like this, like, sutton sappy goodbye, he sings, like, farewell, swan, we'll never meet again, but thank you for doing your duty mm -hmm. of bringing me here. And it's like, I thought that kind of caught the sentiment of what she was about. It was like, thank you mm -hmm. for, like, doing this duty of, like, yeah. trying to, like, you know, all of it. <laughs> yeah. And she was a patron of the arts as well. She was. She was a big And she loved opera. So. And she loved opera, so... <laughs> A fitting cap to that. Well, let's hear it. One for RPG. Thank you. 
That was lovely, Brian. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, is there anything else you got working on right now that we've been looking forward to coming to the pipeline? Um, I just finished a 15-minute musical about chess and an anal beads butt plug toy. <laughs> Sounds like a perfect segue from RBG, really. Just, just <laughs> <so> lovely. <laughs> the man just keeps on turning over the stones, folks. Yeah. You never know what you're going to find with this guy. I like it that way. I like well, variety. Keep us on his toes. That'd, that'd be great. And uh, we're looking forward to that one for sure. <laughs> uh, so, Brian, it's been a pleasure speaking. Before we say goodbye, where can we send people to find out more about these projects? Any you can online check out presence? my website, um, brianmorales.net. Uh, I'm kind of not really active on, on social media anymore. Uh, you had a kid. It's okay. I have a kid. I, I get a pass. You um, get a pass. Yeah, but I'm around. You're around. <laughs> Google me. I'm there. There he is. And, uh, well, Brian, thank you so much for taking the time and being here today. Yeah. Strangers. It's streaming everywhere. Check it out. There you go. Thanks so much. So, listeners, you can find uh, a link to Brian's work in the description of this episode, okay? Uh, thanks again to Brian Morales for joining me on this live and local episode of In What Artworks On Air. It's where I meet the musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists of all stripes that make their home here in Upper Manhattan. If you have a moment, Please show us some love right now and rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts. It really does help. Uh, many thanks to Holy Trinity Church here in Inwood for being our hosts and to HideSites.com for local uptown promotional support. And you can support On Air and all of our Inwood Artworks programs by making a donation at InwoodArtworks.nyc backslash donate or via Venmo at Inwood Artworks. Uh, be for sure to follow us on social media to keep all that we do, which includes the Inwood Film Festival, Filmworks Al Fresco, live performances, and so much more. And Inwood Artworks On Air is proud to be supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. And Inwood Artworks programming is made possible by the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of the Office and the Governor of the New York State Legislature. From the top of Manhattan and the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for tuning in. This is Aaron Sims for Inwood Artworks On Air.